Hey everybody, this is James Pelton. I hope you're having a wonderful Tuesday. I hope you're recovered from Christmas and getting back into the swing of things. Uh, I'm not, but I trust that you might be ahead of me and doing a little bit better. Um, so I'm excited. Today we have Jenny and Michael, and they are from JennyCo. And we've done a recorded video before, but we have never done a live. So I'm excited to see um, just what the audience, what questions they have, what they want to talk about. So uh, what I need from you in the audience is I need you to, first off, this and this is free, so there's no excuse to not do it, but please hit the like button, okay? There'd be no reason to do that. I think you'd have to be a pretty bad person to not do that, hit the like button. Uh, and second off, if you have questions as we're going, this would be the time to ask them. Inevitably, I get questions afterwards, and that's not the right time because then I have to reach back out to them and get the answer. So this is the time to get your questions in right now. So uh, Jenny and Michael, appreciate you guys being here today. Um, could you start with just quick introductions of you guys and then we'll start getting into some questions. Sure, thanks James. Um, Jenny Diggles, one of the co-founders of Jenny Co. Uh, my background is largely in emerging markets and industries. So I love getting into challenging spaces where it's an unknown path, but there's huge potential and upside for people. So. I live in Denver, Colorado, and have been working with Michael for about five years. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Thanks, James. Um, I'm Michael Nova. I'm a physician, but my background's in computer science, and um, I started a number of companies, took one of them public, um, all in the healthcare space. Um, and I've known Jenny, like she says, for about five years, and we've been kind of incubating Jenny Co. Uh, and Jenny mm -hmm. is the Jenny in Jenny Co., if you don't know that. Uh, <clears throat> Jenny's the Jenny. And uh, we've been incubating this for about five years. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I remember we 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 talked about maybe changing the name to James Co. or our Michael Co. Yeah. But uh, stuck with Jenny Co. for now, for sure. Uh, so what I like to do is when we're kind of talking about a product, I think it helps to first talk about the problem, uh, which is the way your website's designed anyway. So we're right on the same line there. So do you want to first talk about the problem that you're looking to kind of solve with Jenny Co.? Sure. Um I'll go and then Michael, you can jump in. So we really saw that there was a big problem going on uh, that is a multifaceted. One is that people have a tremendous amount of healthcare and wellness data that is currently being sold and bought on an open market without their knowledge. Their name is stripped from it, so it's de-identified, but there's a lot of value out there that's floating around. So we wanted to bring that back into the center of the person's control. And then we also really noticed that people, you know, they want to be healthier. They want to make good decisions, but nobody really wants to go to the doctor all the time. Uh, and we're looking for personalized insights. So how we use that data is to allow them to get really deep insights into their own recommendations, how they could improve their health or achieve different goals. Um, so those are kind of the two core challenges that we were looking at. Um, Michael, anything else you'd add there? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, the, the going forward, I think there's a big emphasis on trying to prevent things from happening. Um, yes, you know, you need all the treatments and all that kind of stuff, but, you know, 90% of chronic diseases, whether it's cardiovascular disease or obesity is now a disease or high blood pressure, whatever, is all preventable. Even cancers, 50% are preventable. And so... We're really a public health company trying to take the data that's out there and collect it, you know, from you, the user, and then make recommendations back to you. You know, should you eat this food or should you, <clears throat> you know, uh, put this cream on your face or should you potentially, you know, take this drug? And so we're building an app that basically has that entire capability in it, along with MDs involved with it and a telemedicine service to kind of give you. Uh, you know, a reason, you know, to, uh, if you need help about something, to go to the app instead of running to the doctor all the time. <clears throat> okay. Nope. I love that. So uh, first thing I want to kind of touch on a little bit is you mentioned that people's data right now is being sold back and forth between different institutions and from uh, most industries. And I think healthcare, I don't know that much about healthcare, but it's usually rich people and rich people <laughs> getting richer and then us, we're kind of the product, but we don't really get any benefit from it. Is that kind of the experience in healthcare as well? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I wouldn't go. Yeah, I'd go that far. Yeah, sure. You know, I mean, it's in the U.S. basically has the best healthcare in the world, but you have to pay for it. You know, it's only it's we don't have necessarily really good public health. 
we don't take really good care of the little guy. There's nothing on prevention, you know, basically. It's all kind of react and treat and react. And so, uh, and, and between you, the patient, and the healthcare or the, or the doctor, there's a whole bunch of things in the middle. You know, there are insurance companies and there are claims adjusters and there are, uh, you know, pharmacy benefit managers. And then there's the pharma. It's like all this stuff in the middle and all that stuff in the middle adds cost. You know, it's a reason why we, you know, we our, our healthcare budget in the United States is three trillion dollars, three trillion, not billion, trillion. We have a GDP of about 15 trillion. So it's at least a fifth to a fourth of our GDP. I mean, that's an astronom- astonishing amount of money. And, you know, we're trying again, you know, to take a lot of this data that's generated and give you personal insights about it, you know, that you wouldn't necessarily get any other places. <clears throat> Yeah, no, totally makes sense. Uh, and when you talk about healthcare data, um, do you want to talk about what exactly you mean by that? Are you, are you talking about you know weight and height or uh, health history or what? What kind of what's all included in that? Yeah, I'll take a shot. I mean, yes, all of the what you said, you know, including you know a laboratory test, even a genetic test, but it's also stuff like where you live. You know, it's, do are you living in an apartment? Do you live in a city that has a lot of, you know, smog? Do you live in a food desert? You know, all these things um, that make up, you know, the constitution of, of information about you, the user, that for us is valuable, you know, because maybe we don't give you a recommendation about something that is, you know, a hundred miles away, you can't get to it, but maybe we give you a recommendation about something, you know, that is more useful to you be based around your kind of social graph. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of it's really, it's not just the standard, you know, healthcare information, everybody thinks about an x-ray, you know, test or whatever, you know, it's a lot of this other stuff that can truly make a difference. <clears throat> Absolutely. I, I would also say like, we've been talking about you know, it's not just the physical things, it's where our mind is at too. How stressed are we? What are we thinking about? Um, you know, how do we feel as we go throughout our days? And that, that contributes to our health as well. So, you know, it's very multifaceted. So the factual stuff very much so matters, meaning like the, the, the very data-driven stuff, how much I weighed today, what is my height? Did I drink water? <laughs> uh, but there's other factors at play too. And so making that all accessible to people in one place is really, useful in terms of a personal tool. So like I can kind of track myself and say, am I, am I on point? You know, it's interesting is right now I'm actually in my neighbor's uh, condo. My, my condo has people in it working and I'm sitting at her desk and I don't mean to snoop, but this is right on her desk. And she's been tracking how much she's biked so far this month. She's biked 236 miles and how far she's run. And she's getting into like aromatherapy stuff. So I'm like, this is great. There's all sorts of data that we're all kind of trying to look at for ourselves. Um, so Jenny Co, we really aim to give people an easy way to pull that together into one place. Okay. Uh, can I ask, uh, and this might be a little bit of brain uh, hy- hypothesizing a little bit, um, but what what do you see as the main benefits for people using Jenny Co? Like, are you going to be helping them interpret the data? Is it just a place to store data, a combination of the two? Um, I know you're going to also be paying people for their data. Do you want to just talk about some of the benefits for um, the users? Yeah, for sure. So I, I, all those things are yes. <laughs> yes, all those things are a benefit. You know, we want people to, um, first of all, see how much they already have that is worth money. You know, bring that into your world. Bring that into your viewership so that you can actually start making some better decisions or understand yourself a little bit better. Uh, the data leasing part of it, where people can have full control over their data to say, I do want to participate with my data in this study, or I don't, or I want to give it access in these two or three ways is wonderful because then that allows people to decide who can have access to their data. Of course, all HIPAA compliant with all the the rules that we have in this country around medical data, but it also allows them then to earn rewards for allowing their data to be accessible, which has never really happened before. So there is a big benefit in that as well. What I see is the app overall, it creates a sense of security, in my opinion, for people. You know, it's we want it to be useful every single day. So how do we get somebody to use it every day? What kind of data can they enter into it that will actually give them a positive feedback loop to improve the next day and ideally improve their wallet as well? So um, 
you know, those are some of the things that at a high level I am most excited about for this app. And then from there, there are just a cascading layers upon layers of ways that this can benefit both medical professionals, pharmacists, research scientists, you name it. There's these ways that this product just opens up into so many different channels of potential um, positive change for ourselves. Okay. Love that. Can you talk about any specifics on like, have you spoken with pharmaceutical companies who are like, oh, we're wait just waiting for this to go and then we'll be all over it? Have you spoken with doctors who are like, yeah, we're just waiting for this and ready to go? Um, do you have any like specifics on who has been most interested in it? Um, yeah, I think a lot of yeah, just about everybody, you know, that that mines data, you know, the saying now is, uh, you know, data is the new oil. Um, and that's very appropriate because everybody is now mining data. And, and I mean, it, mining healthcare data is a $50 billion business in the U.S. That's, that's a lot. It's a big and it's growing to 80 billion by the year 2030. Um, and that's that's just healthcare data. That's just mining healthcare data. Um, so, and everybody gets, you know, benefit, potential benefit, you know, out, except for the user, everybody gets potential benefit out of that. Um, and so we have talked to pharma companies and a lot of docs, you know, there's a lot of doctors, a lot of doctor's offices, you know, doctor's groups that are interested in participating, be part, of, you know, being part of our system because they've got things that are valuable too. You know, they've got practice knowledge and, um, <clears throat> the way they do things, you know, uh, all of that, you know, potentially um, has value that we can, that we can extract out and, and potentially give that to the, to the patient, but also the doctor as well. And then storing the data, you know, storing healthcare data, it's very difficult for a person to take a healthcare record and from one place and, and move it someplace else or take it into their doctor's office. This way, they'll have access to their healthcare data in the storage, you know, part of the store, the HIPAA compliant storage that we're providing as well. And it's frictionless. You just update it all the time and the doc can see, you know, the results before you even get in there. Yeah. And I guess, you know, there's one group, um, you know, Nestle is a large company. So I, I feel like I can say Nestle, but I, I don't want to say necessarily the division underneath them. But since Michael and I started moving in this direction a few years ago, the interest has actually been quite easy in terms of what we're doing. This is really fresh data. It's like you're getting it straight from the source versus some secondhand old record that may have been passed around several times and enriched by different data companies. You're actually getting it from the person. So Nestle, and we were too early for this because we didn't really have the product yet, but about two years ago had a division of their company that they wanted to access data around to see if they can make better recommendations uh, with these products that they had. And so, you know, while we were too early, it definitely showed that even with us in the nascent stages of it, there were really large groups that were like, this is valuable, uh, far more valuable, especially if I can get it from somebody. And if that, that data from an actual person, and then they can give feedback to that organization in terms of, I did try these things, or I did try your product, and here's what came of it. That is incredibly valuable data. So being able to have the living <laughs> organism of people inside of the app is going to be really valuable for these large companies. I was wondering, uh, you, you guys actually came to mind the other day when I, I went to an urgent, care, uh, urgent care clinic because my family was sick. And every time we go, if we go to one we haven't been to before, we have to fill out 10 pages of information with all of our parents' medical history and all this. And I was like, it would be wonderful if there was just like somewhere where I could just give them a card or something and it would just fill in all my medical data. Are you guys doing anything like that? Is that part of something that's in the works? Yeah. yeah among, among, among everything else we have to build. Uh, but yeah, sure. You know, it's, it's basically we're collecting all that. We have to make it usable, right? So it's not only usable for somebody that wants to mine the data, like Jenny mentioned. Uh, and but also usable for the user to be able to portable portability is really important. You know, being able to take my record, like you said, to a new EHR or a new <coughs> doctor's office or whatever. And so that part of it, uh, the pointers and the in the in in, in the in the uh, tokens that we're they were making that will go get the data, um, is it's hugely important for us and to have that available for for the individual clients. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. When you have data, the sky is just the limit on how many things, how many different directions you can go with that and uh, different ways it can change society. And uh, not to monologue for too long, but I'm really excited because when I look at crypto, 
I don't see much that actually is going to, ch that changes our day-to-day -day life. And so Jennyco is one of those uh, com companies that I see like, hey, man, if this actually gets rolling, this could change the way um, that the country functions. And uh, so I'm really excited about um, some of that. Um, one more question on the earnings side of it. I know that's people when they hear, oh, I want to make money. I want to make money. Um, one of the things that surprised me most, most last time we spoke was how much money um, your data is actually worth. That really surprised me because we kind of think, who wants to know my weight? Like, who cares about that? Um, but do you want to talk just about potential earnings, how much that data is selling for right now, and just some of those numbers? Yeah, sure. You know, um, if you look at, you know, what's published in the literature and with the, you know, the experience that we have and large, you know, investment firms have done analysis about that. Every Everybody, if you have healthcare, your healthcare data, you're going to generate anywhere between two and 12 terabytes of healthcare data in your lifetime. Um, and so that's, that's, you know, thousands basically of CDs of healthcare data and, and certain healthcare data is a lot denser, you know, than others. But if you take your healthcare data, you just average um, uh, electronic healthcare record or a doctor's note or whatever, and you couple that to a genetic test, um, that's worth about four to 5,000 bucks, you know, depending on, on the type of genetics and depending on, um, you know, how much information that is generated in, 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 the, in the electronic healthcare record. Um, but that's also, you know, not just, you know, for, for you know, a one-time sale kind of thing. You know, it's basically, it's worth that, mu that, that much um, as, 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 as something that if somebody comes in and mines and then maybe you have another company come in and mine it. And it's and it's worth that that much as well. So that's kind of a kind of a big picture. If you look at one of the one of the companies that does tracking of um, uh, of, of met metrics around data and how much data is worth, you know, they estimate um, that it's worth anywhere between again, as I mentioned, a thousand to you know five thousand dollars per user, depending on how dense the data is. So it is worth a lot. It's worth a lot more than. A credit card number or it's worth like or, or, or even a social security number it just is because the data is just so much richer and you can do and it's like you mentioned earlier you can do so much with it and, you know, in many different industries you don't you wouldn't necessarily think that a, a consumer product company would be interested in healthcare data but they are because they're interested in selling more products and the easiest way to make you know personalized recommendations um, is to get is to get data that's about that individual you know, potentially from a healthcare standpoint, and then mine it, and then go out and push products to those people. So as Jenny mentioned earlier, this kind of individual interaction between you, the data supplier, and the large companies um, is really valuable to the companies because they get, you know, a, a series of information about, you know, population groups directly from the user. And that's much more, you know, tenable for them to be able to, you know, push individual products to them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I watch TV and there's commercials for like, well, I can't think, what's, what's a really rare, we'll say leprosy, okay, because that's all that's coming <laughs> to mind right now. But they have these ads for, here's a medication if you have leprosy. And it's like, that probably applies to 0. 0.00001%. They paid a lot of money for that ad and it probably applies to hardly anyone that's watching. So, yeah, if you can give more granular, you know, hey, here's the, all the medicines we have. I don't know why I picked leprosy. That was a really bad example. But <laughs> you guys get what I'm saying, where there's a lot of opportunity um, when you can pinpoint your advertising. Um, it's actually better for everyone. Then I don't have to watch these ads about diseases I don't have. They only pay for the people they're showing it to. And it's really a win, win, win uh, in situations like that. It's yeah, funny. it's not. It's, it, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say I saw a commercial like that recently, and Benjamin and I were watching it, and we're like, they're using terms that we didn't recognize because we don't have this disease, but they were using it in a way where it just made it seem like everybody had this disease. Yeah. And then as we got to the end and read the fine print, I'm like, what is that even? Like, we're not talking about something common here. So I thought the same thing. I thought it was really interesting. I was like, this is not even targeted properly. Um, so yeah, I, I it almost might as well be leprosy at this point. Yeah. And yeah, I, it's just yeah, waste. It's not, right. It's it's I mean, it's it's not but but from a, a company, you know, a couple of comments. So large companies, for large companies, it's a lot easier to sell stuff they already have than to go out and build something and then sell it. So it's a lot easier to sell a drug over and over and over again 
if they can get away with it, right? Uh, <clears throat> instead of going out and having to do all this R and D and whatever and come up and go through an FDA approval and all this, all this kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but but on the but you know the 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 user base can be a lot bigger if they tend if they can target to people that will actually buy the drug and use it because it's going to be better for them instead of something else. They like that idea, even though, I mean, you look at, and, and you look at antidepressants, you know, antidepress, depre, antidepressants are really tough. Um, and, and 80% of them don't work the first time. And how, how do you deal with that? Well, you just give them another one, you wait six weeks and give them another one and see if it works. And then if that doesn't work, you know, in the end, you know, only anywhere between 40 to 50% of antidepressants actually even work for the user. You know, so, you know, if you can get more information, you're much more likely to be able to target something that's going to actually work. And, and, and the users, you know, will pay for that. Um, and then, so we have a question. Jess wants to know how easy to sell my own info. So maybe I could just ask, I think for some people it's hard. So how is this going to work? Like, how does data get uh, to you? Then, you know, how, how does the whole process work? How is the app going to work? Maybe you can just talk through some of uh, some of those things. Yeah, I mean, when you sign up for our app, and then the first thing that we do is we start asking you a few questions. You know, are you, you know, height, weight, you know, all kind of the basic stuff. And that's pretty easy to do, but that starts your journey with us on the data collection side. And then, you know, we'll potentially ask you, you know, some more questions, maybe a day later or whatever. And then we also have the option of you can upload any kind of data or healthcare data, you know, you think is potentially valuable, whether it's an electronic health record or a DNA test or a lab report or all that kind of stuff. You'll be able to upload that, you know, into our system. So it's kind of a continuous, you know, us gathering information about you, you know, for the lifetime, you know, potentially of the user that's, that's on our app. And so it's a very interactive, easy kind of thing. You know, we're not going to bug you every five minutes. And, and you know, we have some special features in the app, you know, that will take your data and, and potentially NFT it and, you know, use it, use it for other kind of fun things. Um, but in general, it's a very kind of non-obtrusive um, way for us to start collecting information about you. Because, again, it's not just... Uh, hardcore healthcare information that we're interested in. You know, we're interested in a lot of different types of data. Your 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 Apple sensors, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And we're collecting right. it in the background. We're kind of collecting it in the background, right? <clears throat> yeah. The other part of it, so that's the front end piece for all of us. But what we would all use is, you know, the app, um, and even you know the web based version of the app, but. The other piece of it, the other side of the coin, is a web-based portal that is accessible for the buyers or leasers of the data. You know, that's really how we look at it is it's leasing. This isn't just take, grab, and go. Um, and so that portal is in development. We're looking at, you know, what are the key use cases, features, all that stuff. So that has to be developed as well. Um, but it's, so it's kind of like two pieces. We have these two customers that we're working with, essentially. The other thing about the app that we've developed that should be out in it when we launch is uh, an AI art component. You know, as we look at all the data that people can enter into the app and we can give recommendations, well, how do we give back a visual representation to somebody of where they're at, you know? And so AI art is oftentimes kind of creepy, a little funny. It's very interesting because it changes so rapidly if you enter in just a few different keywords. So that's a part of the app as well that will hopefully make it really fun and engaging for people to kind of see how they look <laughs> according to the app. I love that. No, I'm really excited about that. And just, yeah, there's so many different health things that we're all trying and, you know, make sure you get enough sleep, make sure you drink enough water, make sure, you know, and I'm just excited to see um, where something like this goes with just better data will get, always get you better results. Um, bad data gets you bad results. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of times um, people are operating on bad data. So I'm excited on the money side of it and also the health side of it. It's kind of a, dual prong so yeah. um i knew this question was coming yeah I, I warned you guys uh but when is the launch when can people start making money um pretty much when anything that you can tell us when on <laughs> so funny so when is the launch we have had uh, almost in a way this is a series of launches that will be happening so um 
We've launched our NFT. So that's on jennyco.io. So there's a way for people to directly get involved right now and to be able to get a genetic test, tokens, and art. Uh, and so then that allows them to be set up and a few other benefits in there as well. But it allows them to be really well set up to get into the Jennyco app with a good piece of data as well. Um, so that launch has already happened. Uh, when it comes to the app, the token launch, all these other pieces that will come out, we do have a couple of things we need to work through. Uh, token launch side, we're very legally compliant. Our team is exceptionally compliant. We don't do things just run and gun and let's just go. So we are working through that process very tediously with our lawyers who are excellent. Um, and so Michael can speak more to the timelines that we're looking at around that and the app as well. So the app, we, we want to put out an MVP version to get into users' hands for feedback um, soon as well. So generally Q1, but Michael, what would you add in terms of details there? Yeah, I think, yeah, no details. It's just that we can almost guarantee it it's going to be in Q1. Um, and I don't, I don't have necessarily a date, but... <clears throat> the, the more we go down this journey, you know, with this company, the more um, things, you know, we find out that we would like to have into, in, in the application. And so we're trying to get the application launched at the same time we kind of do the token generating, generating events. So we don't have to kind of fake it. You know, if you don't have a token involved, you know, right along with the application, you have to do promissory notes and all this other stuff. We don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of trying to line up all the technology along with like i mean we could we could we could launch a token tomorrow if we wanted to but you know we just don't feel like that that gives uh, you know enough value for everybody that's getting involved with us we would like the, you know we want the app to be in a in a place where you know users are really getting you know some benefit from it okay very good so speaking of the genesis nft um i just want to point everybody here jennyco.io and these you can mint these right now correct yes mm -hmm. correct Okay, and um, they cost 0.15 Ethereum, is that correct? Yep, Point roughly 300 bucks. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, and can you remind us again what that uh, comes with when you go ahead and mint that? Man, it comes with a lot, it's so funny. Um, actually, if you just click on what you get, <laughs> let's look at it there, because you know, I think the core benefits that people are getting is that very cool NFT art, and there's, there's varying degrees of that art, whether it's an ultra rare or common. Um, people get Jennyco tokens, um, and then they also will get a genetic test uh, that they can take to get the data back. They'll be invited into a private Telegram channel for the people who participated in this for our own conversations and discussions in that. Um, and what am I missing, Michael? What other things do we bake into the NFT? We put so much in there. <laughs> uh, excuse me. Yeah, there's certain rewards that, that, mm -hmm. that somebody can get you know, once oh, yeah. the app comes out. Yeah. You know, there's a whole reward system in there. So um, it's you're getting a lot of utility, you know, basically, you know, uh, purchasing the NFT. And then the genetic test, when you get the data back, that goes right into your vault. You know, every every user, you know, from user number one to user number one million will have their own vault in a HIPAA compliant fashion. And that's where all the data will be stored. <clears throat> Okay, very cool. And when I uh, when I mentioned this to my community, actually, one of the uh, comments that I kept getting back, so maybe we can talk about this. And then if you have anything else, but that's getting near the end of my questions. But a lot of people said, Oh, a DNA test, I'm not interested in giving that data out there. And people don't understand the security side of it. So can you maybe talk about um, why the blockchain? Why constellation? How secure is that data? You know, we just had a data leak on LastPass, which you would consider that a pretty safe place. Um, what would you kind of say to people who are worried on the security side of things? Yeah, it's a it's a common you know uh, issue for everybody who's worried about not just DNA data, <coughs> but you know data about anything. So the first thing that our chain it might be multiple chains, but our chain is going to be HIPAA compliant. You know, which there are certain rules in healthcare that you just absolutely have to follow. Um, and one of those in the HIPAA, which is an organization that kind of puts out, you know, recommendations for how to move and store healthcare data. One of the things they recommend is to de-identify it, you know, which means um, the user is not really attached to the data or is attached to the data, you know, in a, in a way where it's kind of a tokenization in the middle. And that, that it's almost impossible for a user and the data to kind of get linked up together 
And that's kind of the way we will store the data in HIPAA compliant cloud service. But the chain is also HIPAA compliant. It's really, uh, which is a difficult engineering problem, you know, because you're, you're, you're literally having to comply with the identification, uh, you know, across the entire, you know, chain network and with the state channels. And we, when we're building that basically from scratch, and it's, you know, one of the reasons we decided to go with the Constellation chain was because it was a layer zero and there's a lot of different, you know, types of information. Layer zero is a hardware layer. And so you've got sensors and your car and all this kind of stuff that you can link in, you know, to the chain. And, 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 you know, and the fact that it's, you know, a, a chain that the more people you get to it, basically the, almost the faster it gets because it's a hypergraph. And there's other details to it, but uh, that's, that's kind of one of the reasons. Um, uh, and yeah, <laughs> I think that's about it. Yeah, I think understanding the technology behind the blockchain is really helpful from a security standpoint. And um, and Constellation, like you said, understanding the technology behind the hypergraph is really uh, helpful as well. So we don't have to do a full technical write up on what the hypergraph is exactly right now. But I have other videos if you guys want to go look into that. Um, and if you're in the audience, um, I think it's helpful to understand that constellation, the hypergraph is really what makes this possible on the blockchain. Um, you wouldn't be able to do this necessarily on Ethereum. It wouldn't work uh, quite so well with the high gas prices and things like that. So. Right. You know, we 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 need you know the constellation. I mean, if we want to collect as much data as we can get and not leave necessarily anything out there that's important, we absolutely need uh, a layer zero solution uh, with you know for, you know minimal if, if not none gas fees. So they, they were the obvious, you know, choice, you know, for us to, to use chain. Yes. And I love it. When I look at Constellation, if I want to see, hey, what projects are out there that are looking to change the world and actually do something, uh, you can pretty much just go look at Constellation and what products are building, what projects are building on Constellation. And I go through the list and I'm like, man, all these people are looking to do something. They're not just messing around with tokenomics and they're not just you know, oh, we, we, you know, not no Ponzi-nomics or anything like that, but um, actually looking to change the world for the better. So love that. Well, that was all the questions that I had. Is there anything else that you guys want to talk about? Anything new that's coming up or dates that people should be looking for? Um, I think that if people do want to get into the NFTs, definitely do it sooner instead of later. We have sold, last time I checked just a few hours ago, 505 out of, I believe, 960. So over halfway there. Um, and we have talked about potentially, you know, shutting it down in the new year. Uh, so I would encourage people if they do want to get an NFT to go to JennyCo.io and, and snag one. Um, so I would definitely look for that. <coughs> That's a big one. I would also join any of our channels, you know, follow our Twitter account, uh, Jenny Crow Inc., follow our Telegram. Um, and that's a great way to stay on top of where things are going because we're in such a dynamic industry that changes fast. You know, if people want to know the latest and greatest, they just stay in touch with us. You know, look at what we're doing because um, it does change a lot. We're, we have a standing call with a, a vendor of ours that works with us on something. And what I love is every month when we get on the call with them, there's always been so many things that have happened on our end that are symbiotic with how they work with us. And so it's just great, you know, but uh, we move so fast <laughs> that oftentimes we don't take pause or even take a breath to think about it until those moments. So um, yeah, I, I'd really tell people to get in on the NFT before we are sold out on those. Okay. I love it. Well, thank you guys so much for coming back on and for just giving us an update. I'd love to have you back every so often just to kind of get, you know, what's the state and um, again, sometimes people get excited, but then there's time goes, time goes on. You forget about what you're excited about. Um, so just keeping it on people's mind. And I look forward to being part of this journey with you guys. So thanks for coming on. Thanks, James. Always a pleasure yeah. to talk to you. Yes. And audience, appreciate you guys watching again. The only reason I can do AMAs is because you guys come and watch. So I appreciate you guys. Again, these are free options, so you should do them, but hit like on the video, go follow <laughs> Jenny Co on Twitter. It's free. No reason not to do that. Hop in their Telegram and consider getting one of those Genesis NFTs. Um, if you think this is a long-term project that you're going to want to be a part of, the Genesis NFTs are a good way to kind of get in ground floor, um, not only for you to get in, but also for you to help support um, what they're doing as they're going. So those are my not financial advice. 
but financial nudgings that I'm going to give. So thank you guys so much. And yeah, reach out if you need anything. Happy, always keep me in mind if you need tweets on anything. I'm always happy to retweet for you guys uh, or tweet out anything you need. So let me know. You're the best. Thank you. Thank you guys thank you. so much. And uh, Michael, hope you feel better, brother. Thank you. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying. Hot uh, yeah. whiskey, whiskey with honey in it. I think that's gonna. Okay, work. I did not. Uh, <laughs> my kids were sick this last week. I didn't try that one, but maybe I should have. Uh, yeah, next, well, time, next time. Next <laughs> time. Next <laughs> time. Yeah. So thank All you guys right. so much. Have a good rest of your day.